We are Pro Cannabis Media. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Weed Talk Now. This week, we talk with a very special author. His name is Dean Matt. That is coming up on Weed Talk Now. But reminder, this is a weekly podcast that you can find on all your podcast aggregation networks. And a reminder again, I'm your host and founder of Pro Cannabis Media, Jimmy Young. And I'm Kurt Dalton, the founder of Cannabis.net. And we welcome in Dean Matt, the author of a very good book that both Kurt and I have both received. It's called Gone to Pot. Welcome to the show. And it's all about the cannabis industry. His name, of course, as we mentioned, is Dean Matt. He's the author, but he's also a former CFO of many, many companies. He's worked with two legendary entrepreneurs uh, called, one of them is Brad Jacobs from United Rental. The other is Wayne Heisenga, who made his money in waste management. And he's also owned a few sports teams along the way. Dean Matt is from the great state of Illinois. Dean, welcome to We Talk Now. Like everything about the intro, but the great state of Illinois is kind of a stretch. It's amazing. That's part of your book. You call it the most corrupt state in America. Are you sure? Can we debate that? Yeah, there's, there's not much debate in my mind. But you are a you went to the University of Chicago. You live in a, a, a suburb of Chicago. I don't want to name the name, but it begins with an N. And, you know what you have, a you love where you live, right? I mean, you have an opportunity to live anywhere you want, Dean. Why still in Illinois? Uh, good question. We got one foot out the door. Uh, if I had my way, I'd be in Arizona. My wife's dragging us to Florida. We got a little place down there already. So we'll, we'll probably do one of those 50-50 uh, things, just enough to, to tip the scale so we have residency like Trump in Florida. There you go. <laughs> and there's no income tax, right, in Florida? It's not the, isn't that what? I knew there was a reason there for sure. Um, uh, Dean, the first question I'm going to ask you is about why you did this book. Um, you, you had no reason in the world. You were retired. You, you have your wife alongside. You go flying all over the world. You can go pretty much wherever you want and do whatever you want. Why in the world did you get into the cannabis industry? Yeah, great, great question. So I was retired two years ago uh, at this time. And uh, as, as you said, I've been flying since high school. And my wife just took up golf five years ago. So we've just been golfing and flying. So finally had some time on our hands. And uh, the phone rang in the summer of 2018. And the company needed a CFO. And ordinarily, I would say, you know, no thanks or listen a little bit. But this is the cannabis industry. So I know nothing about it. I know nothing about a lot of the industries I go into. I kind of think that's an advantage. And uh, I was intrigued, you know. At that time, guys, you got to remember, at that time, July of 2018, the industry was exploding, right? You know, Tilray was uh, $300 a share, and, and that was the time I was in it. So it was a great time. I was hired to, to take this company public in, uh, as their CFO on the Canadian exchanges, and it, it, it intrigued me. It was definitely a fixer-upper. I've taken companies public before, um, but... Uh, that's why I got that's why I got into the industry. Gotcha. Dean, yeah, it was your book is fascinating because you're an outsider with a, a long business history that came into the industry. So if I go back to the big bang moment, the moment that shook the world, where were you when? Bruce Canopy, they get over four billion from Constellation. Where in the process were you? What did you think of that deal? And kind of how did it affect what you were doing? Yeah, so that happened about a month after I started with this company in Chicago, which was an MSO. We had six or seven operations and 50 legal entities in a half a dozen states with a lot of acquisition of prospects as well. Everyone was throwing money at us. So that's, that's kind of where I was. And when, when Canopy got the, uh, the big investment, that was a shockwave throughout the system, as you said. And the valuations just went up uh, exponentially overnight, way ahead of themselves. You know, but I think the people in the industry, the guys that are running these MSOs, you know, think about it. I mean, a lot of these guys haven't worked for anybody else before. They haven't, they haven't worked in corporate America. In the company I was at, I was the only one that actually worked in corporate America. So to some extent, people thought that this was normal. 
you know, and they haven't lived through the internet era, you know, as, as I have and other, other dot-com bubbles and, and Bitcoin bubbles and things like that. So the problem I think that happened to the in industry is that money was flowing too freely. I mean, I've been in companies where I've struggled to raise two or three million dollars. It took, you know, all summer to do. We got a hundred million dollars in a month and a half, and I didn't even have financials to give to anybody. So it was just definitely, as, as, I, as you read my book, it was Green Acres or the Wild West. You know, I, I felt like Mr. Douglas in Hooterville. But that's probably one of the worst things that happened to the industry is the, is the free flow of money. And these investors should have known better. But they didn't, and they still threw millions of dollars at inexperienced management teams, uh, speculative uh, enterprises and business models. How in the world did they get these people to do that? Well, uh, you know, I, so, so since I was with this initial company, in eight months, we ended up not going public. We ended up selling to uh, a company instead. And after that, I spent another now, you know, I'm still consulting and an employee in various companies. Spent all last year on the West Coast, California, Nevada, Arizona, uh, Oregon even. And that's when I started to write my book on the plane because it's like one of these things to shake your head, you know. As you mentioned earlier, I worked for a couple entrepreneurs. So that's my reference point, you know. Uh, so I'm not easily impressed with, with anything going on in the cannabis industry. And I don't think investors should be either, you know. There's a lot of people that's, that's working very hard. You know, they're busy doing this and that. But, you know, right now, I, I don't even know if the industry's in investment grade. I, I do think that mid to long term, the prospects for the industry are, are great. I mean, just great. But as with any um, land grab opportunity, you've got to have people that have been there, done that before. And I think that's one of the flaws, uh, Jimmy and Kurt, that we have in the industry so far. There was no math done. It was the Wild West. It was spending other people's monopoly money. You know, so investors basically uh, came into these companies and told the, the CEOs, hey, I want you to get in there. I want you to take this company public and I want to flip it. You know, so it was in and out. You know, that was the expectation. And these guys have never run public companies before. Just thought, oh, it's easy. How hard could an audit be, you know? <laughs> you know, that's why I go in there. First thing I did is I hire a room full of auditors. I said, guys, we got two years, two or three years of, of financials to get done. Well, will that get done next month? No, it's, it's, it's going to take time. So they're just very, very naive about what it takes to uh, run a company with many shareholders or take a company public. You, you just mentioned it actually in your answer that you like the industry and the future looks bright. It's going to lead to my next question. We have an article up on cannabis.net saying there will be another bubble. When US legalization uh, happens, it's gonna change the UN drug treaties. You're gonna have the G20 countries all be able to grow, produce, sell legally. And with a couple trillion dollars looking to invest, we will have an another cannabis bubble just based on supply and demand of numbers like you talk about in your book. Do you agree or disagree? You know, Kurt, I haven't even thought about that that far out. I mean, that, that makes those numbers make my head hurt. You know, so. <laughs> and you're pretty smart. so. <laughs> well, I, I really haven't even thought about that. But I will say that a lot of these companies thought that they could be all things, all people. I mean, a lot of these companies today in the last year and a half before this bubble burst ran out to Colombia and they wanted to go to Greece and they wanted to go all these different <laughs> countries. And I'm like, guys, there's a lot to do, you know, right back here in our own backyard. There's no, no need to do that. And that land grab mentality um, is, is really what's caused the prices of these acquisitions to go through the roof. I, I read about many of these, these uh, failed ac acquisitions and these goof, just stupid prices that people have paid for, for acquisitions. And right now we get what we paid for, you know, 90% down on the, on the stock market right now. And uh, I, I contend and make a lot of predictions in the book until we really get some people that have been there, done that before in the C-suites, you know, right now there's a lot of lawyers, there's a lot of donut shop owners and, and things like that. But, uh, and they built something. They built something of value, just not of the value that they think it is. I love some of the expressions that you use and some of the uh, um, 
things that you bring up in this. The land grab strategy was one in company A, how they had a $30 million valuation mistake, I thought was a great story to start with. Um, but due diligence, OG, which I thought was a strain of cannabis or old guy, and I turned out it's original gangster, no idea. Uh, they don't know what they don't know. Can you talk a little bit about that statement? Because it is a theme through a lot of this, uh, these experiences that you've had. Yeah, and I like to differentiate because I think I do a good, I, I may be wrong, I think I do a good job of, kn of knowing what I don't know. I'm not the guy to talk to about should cannabis be a legal product, the, the health benefits of, of, of cannabis, the different strains, how to grow. I'm not that guy, okay, but I'll go toe to toe with anybody about why the industry is in its sorry state right now. You know, so. Um, so there was a lot of just na naiveness, naivete in, in these owners because they've never run anything before. And if you think about it, Jimmy, on one hand, the best thing that some of these guys have done is they've never worked for anybody before. Why is that? Because they don't know red tape. They, you know, they just plow through a brick wall. It's not elegant. It's not efficient. But they kind of charge ahead and get it done. So a lot of these guys get high, high marks for that. But then the worst thing that they've done is never worked for anybody before because they don't know fiduciary responsibility and transparency and what audits are for and how long audits take. So, you know, some of the naivete I've seen is that thinking a, a, a two-year audit for a company that's got six operating companies and 50 legal entities could get it done in a month and a half. I mean, that's just wishful thinking. They just don't know, you know, those and types of things. One company, Dean, you, you, you mentioned by name in your book and went on record was MedMen and Adam Bierman. Um, obviously, I think the latest is they're trying to seize his house, the creditors, and kind of what's your opinion today on MedMen's future and, and what they need to do to turn it around? Yeah, so what I write about, I've never met him. You know, I've, I've seen the legend. I've read a lot of the stories. I've seen a lot of the interviews, and, and he was a rock star in, uh, in the summer of 2018. And investors who should have known better let their guard down, just like we've seen in the internet era, for instance. But you know, the come to Jesus was in November of 2019 when they put out a press release. You know, our results aren't going to be that good, and mea culpa, and um, you know, we're going to get cash flow positive. I was just on Harvest's uh, analyst call yesterday. Same thing there. We're going to you know be profitable. You know, we'll see. Maybe, the, but the question is, why haven't you been profitable all along? What's you know? So they they finally realized that you know cash uh, is a scarce resource and it's not infinite. And again, that's the lack of them operating, uh, lack of their operating experience in the past. You know, Brad Jacobs, the guy I worked with, we took a, a company public. It was a garbage company. Uh, he ended up selling that company for $2 billion and it was a roll up, a land grab in different geographies. And after he successfully did that, I mean, he walked away from tons of acquisition potentials. A lot of these guys don't, it's a bidding war. I've, I've run, um, I've run mergers and acquisitions for a $13 billion, uh, division of a, of a huge food conglomerate at one time. And, you know, I can't tell you all the math that I did on, on those deals, you know, but here it's, here it was very emotional. We're just going to pay in stock. As I write in the book, these guys wouldn't know how to, how to put pencil to paper and figure if they're overpaying or underpaying and, and their investors were pushing them and pushing them just to go out and cast your net and get as much land as possible. That strategy only works if you know how much cash you're going to be burning. And if you look out over the horizon, you know, there was none of that in the companies I've been associated with. There was no looking ahead. You know, it was like, go, 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 go. And so when you overpay for acquisitions, you know, this is the result. Hey, I, think, uh, I think one thing I, you didn't talk a lot about in the book, but I've, now after I read the book and finished it, I'm curious, the black market, how much of a force and impact is this having on sales and how does eventually this, this game end? Is it federal legalization or how does the government get a hold of and slow the black market down? Well, I spent a lot of time out in California last year. And, and uh, again, I don't know it as, as much as other people know it out there, but I think, I think the takeaways are 
I mean, I know investors that just say, you know, I'll, I'll pitch them a deal or whatever. They'll say, is it California? I say, yeah, I don't want anything to do with it. Mm-hmm. It's just too, it's, it's just a, a, an intangible right now. But I think what's happening, not only the black market, but with taxes as well. So California, the prices are being affected by the black market and by taxes. And the same thing here in Illinois, you know, our, our uh, mayor of Chicago and the state of Illinois think they're doing good things by having some high taxes so that they could rake in the revenue. But I think what they're doing is just prolonging the black market. You know, you want to pay, you know, twice as much at a, at a legal store as you would with your neighbor, with your neighborhood guy, you know, so that's really prolonging the issue. And then the, the issue of oversupply, uh, and, and demand, you know, we're seeing that in Canada and the companies are just falling by the wayside right now. But, you know, I think there was a, there was a rush in Illinois, for instance, they had 60 medical dispensaries and then seemingly overnight, everyone that had a medical dispensary gets a, an adult use license. What a, what a windfall that was, you know, and I think the rush is that the state of Illinois was looking for the path of least resistance so that it could start raking in tax revenue. And another thing that that kind of exacerbated here in Illinois is us old white guys, all those, all, all the old white guys that had, and some of them aren't that old. Oh, he's looking at me. He's looking at me. He's looking at me too. But, OGW. Um, yeah. But all that did is, is, is entrenched uh, old white guys in owning these licenses, you know, and I write in my book, I think it's going to be very tough for social equity participants to have its intended effect now. And I was just on a call uh, last night in Maryland, the same thing's happening. Hold that thought for a second. A reminder, you're watching and listening to Weed Talk Now, our weekly podcast with interesting people in the cannabis industry. Dean Matt, the author of Gone to Pot, certainly one of them. And we are also available on all your podcast aggregation networks as well. And you can find us on all those social media outlets that are out there, including your YouTubes, your Facebooks, your Instagrams, and your Twitters. That's where you'll find We Talk Now and Pro Cannabis Media. So as I was mentioning, and, and you mentioned old white guys, it's old white guy guilt that is driving a lot of this industry because of what we've done to people of color in this country. It, it, it's horrible and horrific. It's part of our history. Um, and now, you know, you see a lot of these lawmakers saying, oh, we want to expunge the records of the people that have been most affected on the war on drugs. Well, that's great. Expunge the records by all means. <laughs> but you must give them an opportunity to get into this business. And everything is working against those people you talk about in, in your book. Um, how are we going to get out from this or is there going to be funding available specifically targeted for the economically empowered groups that are out there that want to get into this business? And again, every state is different, Dean. You know, here in Massachusetts, we love to wave the liberal flag, but our governor shut down the adult use recreational industry because of COVID-19 and let the medical community continue. Um, you're always fighting against that stigma that has been around for 80 years. And, and the people that have paid the price in that 80 years, it's time for them to get a shot at this. Are we going to see that? Well, I, I think I just heard just within the last week, I think Illinois is putting, a, as you mentioned, the fund, I think they're putting together a fund of 30 million. I think that's, that's a way to go. Um, in, I write in my book, I think the deck is stacked against mm-hmm. social uh, equity applicants. Mm-hmm. First off here in Illinois, they announced this program in a, a new round of licenses in October of last year, and they give everybody 90 days to get their applications in, meaning that they had to be in, by January 2nd. So all these social equity applicants are getting excited, but I think the deck is, has been stacked against them because they don't have the experience in writing an applic- uh, a winning application in 90 days. They don't have the contacts. Financial strength is, is be- so they're gonna get points for being social equity, but I think those points are gonna be trumped by the experience, the entrenchment, you know, of all the people that already have stuff. Um, there is local rule where a couple aldermen in Chicago have said, 
I don't care if you want a license or not, unless you're a social equity applicant or associated with that, don't plan on opening your store in my, in my award, basically. So there's, there's much more that's needed, but it's pervasive throughout the country as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you brought up in your book, The Straw Man, too, uh, companies who are going to be tempted to get the token person that to get that license or get that delivery and then either move them out or kind of let them be a figurehead and run it beneath them. Well, that's commonplace. I mean, to, I mean, I know that the companies I was associated with had to apply, apply in Ohio and Pennsylvania and all that stuff. But um, the, the problem I, I've observed is that they'll go cut a deal. Hey, I need, uh, I need boots on the ground in Ohio. You're a very wealthy person out there. Uh, I'd like to put you, and you're a doctor or whatever. I'd like to put you in my application. Well, what's in it for me? Well, we'll give you a cut or whatever. And, and these deals were never formalized. So lo and behold, if the company wins, now the guy in Ohio is in, in the bird's eye seat. Says, well, hey, I know we talked about, I'll get, you know, 250,000 for being part of your application and helping you win it. But you know what? I'm going to hold you hostage. And now I want a million dollars. And again, that's just inexperience. You don't, you don't go into these uh, arrangements unbuttoned. You know, you don't let, expose your shareholders to the whims of some nut job out in Ohio or Pennsylvania that's going to hold you hostage. I mean, that's just, that's just management 101. Speaking of Management 101 and another thing that we picked up in your book, and I'm going to give you uh, kudos for this. Your author's notes, if you just put a thing together of all your author's notes, um, that is great reading unto itself. And the one that I love the best, okay, is $1 million for a logo, okay? And then you <laughs> decided, wait a second, you're crazy. Go give 200 bucks to the local high school art class and we'll use a logo from them. Great idea. I love anything giving back to youth. And I've always said you give a kid a chance, they'll blow you away with their ability. And then your author's note, to this day, I kick myself because you probably had, you could have gone to a grade school and got it done for 50 bucks. You still feel the same way about that? <laughs> yeah, well, it just shows you how cheap I am, basically. <laughs> basically. <laughs> the, the, the viewers will have to read that, uh, but I, I do. Um, I did try to make the book humorous to pe keep people laughing instead of crying because there's a lot to cry about. Um, I, I'm not kind to a lot of people in the book. Medmen, as, as you mentioned earlier, you know, I, I, I don't. Who knows if they're going to survive? Uh, they had all sorts of problems, you know, that you read from the lawsuits. A lot of the info from the book came from publicly inf uh, information lawsuits. But I did put some. Um, some things in there just to keep people laughing. You haven't mentioned what I think about Captain Sully Sullenberger. I don't think much it's about in him. In my notes, I have it in here. You are in there. It is <laughs> between golf and Sully, you're in my notes. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, just to go off tangent a little bit, uh, my, wife, my wife loves the movie and she loves Sullenberger and Tom Hanks made a movie. I said, you know what? What's so hard about landing a plane on the longest, widest, flattest runway Ever. He didn't have any choices. He either crashes in the buildings right. or lands in the Hudson. Or he did a big deal, you know. But you know, we have to premise this. You've been flying since you were in high school, correct? I think you were introduced to it by your dad, yes? Yeah, yeah. And, and you own a plane. So you are a licensed, experienced pilot. You know, for those of us who have really only been passengers on planes, um, and I have been in a few small planes as well, um, it freaks a lot of people out, but isn't flying a simple concept about when it's air and gliding through air? Isn't that how you fly? I, I couldn't even tell you. <laughs> I, look at, I look at 747s, I'm like, how the hell is that thing getting in the air? You know, I don't know anymore. But the, the, a lot of pilots get in trouble because they uh, get in over their head with weather, for instance. You know, I'm instrument rated so I could fly in weather, but everyone's got to have their personal minimums, you know. My wife and I are going to West Virginia next week, and, uh, you know, I could fly in the clouds, but if the ceiling's too low, you just got to choose not to do it. I, I, I looked on uh, the internet the other day on one of these sites, and people were complimenting this, this pilot. They had a, a, a video of a pilot landing or a plane landing on a highway, a crowded highway, and he didn't hit anybody. And dozens of comments, <laughs> this guy's an excellent pilot. 
wow, this guy is really, and I'm like, this guy's an idiot. He's, he, ran, he ran out of fuel. I mean, so and it's, to some extent, it's like that in the internet business. Everyone's looking at the hard work that's being done, but you step back and look at the big picture. I'm a tough grader. You know, I don't grade on a curve. You know, you could put your money in cannabis. You could put your money in, in food manufacturing, you know. But there's not a good reason uh, over the last year to put your money in cannabis until you start getting boards that, that don't give hall passes anymore to inept managers, you know. And we're seeing some of the C-suites starting to be cleaned out. And we're seeing a lot of focus on profitability. You know, it's all talk right now. Mm -hmm. I think these companies still don't have any, um, any, uh, any uh, trust yet of the investing public and the equity analysts that follow their stock. There's a lot of skepticism on these calls, you know, and uh, they've got to have a couple quarters of being able to look ahead and, and meeting their projections. And with COVID now, it just makes it all that much more difficult to do. But the top, I, I, line's, still, top line's still growing. And I'm, I'm sensing that there's a, an emphasis now on cost where there wasn't before. It was all top line revenue. Gotcha. Uh, on the calls you're doing, you just, you walk, you get, you're hitting all my questions. How is COVID affecting this industry at the 50,000 foot flight level from what you're hearing and talking to people? So what I'm hearing is that the basket size is generally bigger. There was a big push when this thing first started out and everyone got excited. Oh, you know, uh, cannabis is recession proof. Look at what the revenues are doing. Well, you know, it was pantry loading, right? Everyone was kind of loading up. Um, still to be determined, I think, if people uh, whose who's, uh, spendable resources, whose uh, you know, extra money, do they want to spend it on cannabis? I think that jury is still out, uh, but they do go curbside. You know, all these companies are, are attacking this with curbside delivery. Mm -hmm. To some extent, it actually is more efficient because people are spending less time nosing around in the in the dispensaries, and they they get on the phone or get on the they make their order and they just pick it up curbside. So, it's, to some extent, it's a little bit more efficient at the dispensary level. Um, the basket size is larger because they don't make as frequent trips there anymore. You know, so I, I've heard that quite a bit as well. Um, all the companies are kind of managing through and kind of reinventing, uh, reinventing themselves. Um, so I don't know if this has been a, a huge impact uh, either way, um, but uh, that's what I hear is going on. Do you think, I know there was just, I think Aurora just came down and bought a US CBD company and there's kind of the, well, this is gonna happen now a lot more. This is how Canadian companies will get their foothold here. Agree or disagree? I haven't thought through that, so um, I guess directionally it makes sense that that's how they could get their foothold here. Um, so I, I guess I would agree with that. Let me ask you a question about uh, the Safe Banking Act. You, you mentioned that at the tail end of your book. We know that uh, the most recent COVID-19 recovery bill in Congress right now um, has uh, an amendment in there that includes the Safe Banking Act that flew through the House about, I want to say it was like five months ago, but of course, it, what did you say? Uh, cannabis is dog years. Um, so do you expect that the Republican controlled Senate is willing to give the Democrats a win by getting the Safe Banking Act as an amendment in this time in, uh, in, in our, our history right now? Yeah, I don't know if they will or not. You know, as as the whole bill, you know, from what I hear, it's going to be dead on arrival. I don't know if they're going to resurrect pieces out of it. I do write in the book that you know, I think the the industry will be safer. I think everyone agrees with that. You can't have you can't have delivery drivers riding around, you know, with with fifty thousand dollars of cash. Uh, so there is banking that's needed. You know, I tell a couple stories in the book of how it's impacted some companies I've, I've been associated with. Um, and what a waste of time uh, for CFOs or people in, in the, uh, the accounting. You know, we must have been pitched. I'm still getting pitched. Oh, I've got your solution. You know, I've got your credit card solution. I've got your <laughs> ATM and, and banking solution. I, I ask for two things when people call me up. Can I get a routing number and a checking account number and a debit card? Yeah, we could do that. Well, I, I tell in the book, 
you know, after analyzing and trying to vet these people out before spending time filling out forms and things like that, um, I still wasted tons and tons of time because these guys never came through, you know, guys that I thought I really vetted. So I'm just skeptical. I mean, and the guys that don't deliver these products right now, it's, it's all alternative banking and stuff like that. But CFOs controllers throughout the country are just wasting a heck of a lot of time trying to find the right solution. And I'm sure there's a right solution out there. I, you know, I just don't have time to, to find what that is, but that's needed in the industry. Everyone agrees with that. Well, I, I think you're right. I have friends who work at Visa and MasterCard and, and they're the same way. You'll, you'll see these emails and I have the solution and, and you just, you ask Visa and MasterCard directly. And now um, I think Visa US bought Visa International a few years ago. So it's real cleaned up. Like in no way do we authorize from us a, uh, what do they call it? A code for cannabis sales in America. But I uh, continually, you'll get 10 emails a day that says we can do it. It's all legal. And you're absolutely right. So I think there is some cleanup more to do on that side. Um, if you look out and had to throw a dart or your own investment money, what niches or areas of the industry do you like 24 months? What, what, get, what piques your interest now that you have this much experience? Um, I don't like MSOs. Um, let me start with, with that. I, yeah. I think do, do with what MSO, you don't like and we'll get to what's left. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, we'll have to do it that way. I think the MSOs just overextended themselves. I mean, even, even you hear acreage and harvest talk that, you know, we haven't, we, we stopped this deal with Verano. We're going to concentrate on a fall or a smaller footprint. And I think there's some merit to that, you know, unless, unless you got guys at the top that have been there, done that before, you know, then cast that net, but, but we don't in this industry right now. So concentrate on making yourself profitable and then expand from there. I think that's a good strategy. Um, there will be consolidation that continues in the industry uh, by definition and necessity a necessity because people are running out of money. Uh, people are not well funded. Um, I do write in the book, just a couple of products I've kind of been somewhat associated with. Uh, you know, there's tons of, I had one come across my desk today, a CBD, you know, company. Uh, but these guys had no, no experience in the, in the industry. It was evident from looking at their 90 page deck you know, that they had no experience in the industry um, and don't know the extent of the competition that's out there. Um, uh, CBD cigarettes, I've, I've associated with a company that does a lot of work on CBD cigarettes. There, there could be some merit to that. Uh, when, when Las Vegas opens up, consumption lounges are, are uh, you know, on the uptick as well. But I think what the, I think the last, chapters of my book, I, I write that the industry needs to quit running tr trick plays and just blocking and tackling right. three yards and a cloud of dust for now. Vince Lombardi would be proud of you for sure. Um, absolutely. Um, let me ask a little bit. You're wearing your shirt. I want to get into the love of flying you have. Mucho dinero. You've got this 50 states, uh, 50 rounds of golf in 50 states in 50 days. Is that on hold because of COVID or are you still moving forward with that? It was on hold because of the cannabis. So we were, you know, getting sponsors and trying to get teed up. We've been in touch, my wife and I, in touch with Guinness World Record, you know, to, to get that. We know all the specs and trying to line up the golf courses and, and the hotel sponsors and things like that. And then I got involved in cannabis. So that's been on hold for a couple of years. In the meantime, I've had a hip surgery. And, you know, who knows if I'll be able to pull, you too? Yeah, who knows if I'll be able to pull that one off uh, anymore. But it's, yeah, it's still a dream. Uh, of mine to, to kind of get that done. Yeah, I had my left hip done twice over the last seven years now, and it's good now. I can give you some hope. And usually it takes a full year for you to get back to where it used to be, if that gives you any hope moving forward. Yeah, no, I'm moving. I had it six months ago. I'm moving around pretty good. Are you playing and, golf uh, yet? Are you playing golf? Oh, yeah, playing golf, but not running. I used to run, and I, I kind of miss it. And I think the knees and, the, and my hips go you know, go. Right. It, there's an imbalance now. You're going to have an imbalance and uh, <laughs> hate to talk my, about my body, but you're definitely going to have issues with your S1 L5 right at the top of your tailbone, because that's where the, the balance is between your hips. You know what I'm saying, right? Yeah. I think if we're going to talk about old, old guy problems, we're going to lose <laughs> half our audience. Different podcast, right? <laughs> Let me um, ask you, uh, Dean, 
Um, so you were saying you want to see the quality in the C-suite before you get excited or would make a good move. Let's play fantasy CEO like they play fantasy football. Give me a couple names in your wish list that if you saw we're transitioning to a cannabis or CBD company, you'd say, oh, I like him or that's good. Oh, I mean, I, I wouldn't even get down to the name level. I mean, it's, it's, it's even more basic than that. Do you have any experience in, in corporate America? <laughs> have Do you, you have a college degree? <laughs> well, no. Again, these guys that are in there now, some are lawyers, some are, are entrepreneurs. These, you know, kudos to them. They work hard. They put the industry on the map. But it's, it's the Peter principle. You know, they, they don't have the um, experience in running multi-state operations with two, three, four, 500 employees. You know, there's quite a, quite a big difference there. Um, they don't know how to scale. Here's, here's something that happens in all the companies, not only in the cannabis industry, but I've seen this elsewhere as well. These companies traditionally underinvest in the back office, HR, finance, accounting, et cetera. I had three people in my accounting department when I, when I started with this $30 million company, three people in six different States, you know, the mindset just isn't there to scale a company and you got to spend some money on, on some costs. You know, a lot of times the, the entrepreneurs, because that's the way they're wired, unless you're, unless you're selling something or, you know, whatever, you're a cost to me and I want to minimize those costs. So, you know, Green Thumb, for instance, they've got 30 people in their accounting department. You know, we were about the same size, although we weren't public, we had three. So that math just doesn't work. And I see that all across the board. You know, look at what's happening. You don't have enough people in your HR department. Uh, everything is done on, on the, on the uh, real, real thin. You're going to have lawsuits. You're going to have shareholder lawsuits. You're going to have employee lawsuits. You know, uh, when we tried to sell our company, the first thing that uh, we have a couple public companies asked me for is projections. Dean, can I see your projections for the next year? I said, we don't have any. You know, that, that's just that's just like you're, you got to be kidding me. But that's that was life as normal, and in the company I was associated with, you know, so they got to spend more money to scale. Are we in a perfect storm right now for this kind of uh, business venture? You've got a, 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 a industry that's being projected in the trillions. You've got very little knowledge about what works in the industry as far as what is going to be profitable. And Kurt talks about this all the time. You know, nobody in the cannabis industry has made any money yet. Right, Kurt? Isn't that what you say a lot of times? Unless you're touching the flower. Right. OK. And or you got in really early. And now, um, you know, because it's a cash economy and you've got the male ego gets involved with this too, not just in the business corporate space, but also in the local legislators and the, the host agreements that are out there just waiting to be um, manipulated, if you will. Um, are we seeing that perfect storm and, and is it going to change uh, in the future and how might it change in the future when once you clear out some of these uh, young people that are in there um, just getting funny money thrown at them? Monopoly money, I believe, is how you refer to it. Yeah, well, I think, you know, the companies I'm associated with have always kind of been, the most successful ones have always been run by the numbers. I mean, waste management uh, was run by the numbers. Every month we went into our, our uh, next level up, our regions, and our, res our results versus budget, our actuals versus budget were reviewed. What's going good at your company? What's going bad? You know, are you, how you doing spending on CapEx? That's running a business. You know, these cannabis companies are slowly getting into that mode where they are really running a business. You know, we had to know our numbers. We had to know what our bogey was, et cetera. I'll contrast that. I'll, I'll add, I was with a, an international airline caterer that was losing millions of dollars a year. And I go out to see uh, the, the, the New York uh, kitchen, for instance, and I'm talking with the chef. And the chef's like, oh, Dean, I just found this great, this great bakery down in, uh, in Soho. And I'm going to bring them into, uh, I like their little croissant that they use. We're going to put it on the Air France plane. I'm like, wait a minute, Pepe or whatever his name was. 
I said, you've got 13 bakeries that you're dealing with. I don't want another one. We want, I want you to get that down to like five and save some money. You just don't understand all the costs. And to some extent, that's the way it is with the cannabis companies too. Everyone's an artisan. You know, the growers are, are, are the chefs, are the artists, are the artisans. My flower does this and that's good. But what's, what's the strategic plan in running a business? You know, so um, the C-suites need to give these guys more directions. You know, I want you to develop one new product next year or, you know, this and your yield has to be here and, you, and your cost per gram has to be here. And everyone's got to understand that we're, we're, we're not there yet in, in the industry. By, by a long stretch, but we're starting, we're starting to get that awareness. You see, all you got to do is pay with stock. That's, I mean, as you say in your book, it's not real. Just, just pay everything with stock. Who cares? <laughs> that was a yeah. great part. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> One of the companies that you talked about, and I got to bring this up again, was the, the company that had the liberal vacation policy of up to eight weeks in a year. Now, when I read that, I almost, I almost blanked myself because I'm like, I can't, how can you get involved with a company like that that's run by a bunch of 20 or 30 somethings and wants to give out eight weeks of vacation a year? A perfect example, again, of mismanagement in the cannabis space, right, Dean? Yeah, I'll, I'll let your viewers read it for themselves, but um, it, ha it had to do with a, uh, an HR policy where the owner thought the person that was running this policy was doing it. I'd say uh, kind of normal, but, but she was not running it normal. She was giving the store away. I mean, she was giving people eight weeks of vacation and the owner didn't even know. Well, that's not running a business, right? Running a business, there's gotta be meetings. There's gotta be accountability. There's gotta be review of the financials. And if the owner is not doing that with his team, you know, the owner can't scale a, a company to be a $200 million company by himself, you know? You've got to have that team beneath you. And it's just not in some, some owner's DNAs. You know, some people have their thumb on the cash register and, and, and they do a good, uh, a, good, uh, a good business and they understand all that stuff. But if you're going to achieve a $200 million company, you got to develop a team. And that's just not in these people's DNA. Well, that's, that's too bad. Because it's still supply, demand, cash flow, and costs. I mean, basic business 101, yes? Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of business 101, and um, in the case of the vacation example, it really was ab absurd what was what was happening. People were getting eight weeks of vacation. They were cashing out their vacation. I mean, they thought they were working for the government for crying out loud. You know, it was it was just it was just nuts, and it was going right under right on underneath the the CEO's nose, and he didn't even know it. And there's basic internal controls that auditors look for. And if you're going to run a business, you just got to have basic internal controls and check them. But if you're too busy running around overpaying for acquisitions and you don't meet with your people and, and have the right uh, accountability and uh, infrastructure and internal controls, this stuff goes on. And shareholders, you know, think that they're investing in well-run, well-oiled companies and their money's safe and all that stuff. It's not. It's not. A lot of companies I've been associated with, there's been no accountability. Uh, as, as you mentioned earlier, people have overpaid for acquisition. Nobody knows but, but, but the owner. And there's a ton of wasted money. Now, there's going to be wasted money in startups. You know, don't get me wrong. But, but, but just the, the misuse that I've seen of, of investor money and, and the waste and the, the kind of the secrecy is, is just absurd. Does big tobacco, big pharma, or big alcohol come rolling in here in a year or two? And, and, and you know, the, the, the C-suite of uh, R.J. Reynolds, do they, is that in the future? And would that clean it up? Yeah, it's, it's going to happen. I don't, I don't know when, but um, when I was with uh, Brad Jacobs at United Waste Systems, we bought mom and pop landfills and hauling companies in the most out-of-the-way places, you know. Upper Peninsula of Michigan, Westford, the backwoods of West Virginia and Kentucky. We did the hard work that no one else wanted to do. We got our systems in place and we put a nice bow tie around them. And now a bigger company is interested in the package that we created, you know. So 
they're not interested in little onesie twosies, but we were able to get, you know, some critical mass of, of companies to do that. And I think that's what the cannabis, uh, the ultimate ex exit strategy is going to be. But Philip Morris and, our, and all these guys, the, the big tobacco and, and big alcohol, it's, a, you know, they look down at it and say, it's a freaking mess right now. You know, you, get, you better get your act together. There'll be consolidation, you know, where, where maybe there's two dozen MSOs in the, in the company, uh, in the country, maybe there'll be three or four good ones. And as the consolidation starts to mature and they have confidence in the numbers, we still don't have confidence in the numbers. Look at all the layoffs and the write-offs and all that stuff. Even though these are audited people, these are audited companies if you're public, right? But there's no confidence in the number. But yeah, I think, I think you're a fool to, to not believe that they're going to come in at some point in time. And What's your prediction on federal legalization without getting political and presidencies and re-elections? What's your, what's your, if I said, when's it going to be federal legalized? What would be your answer? I know the answer. It's in the book. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, I may have changed a little bit. I said within five years, but yep. you know, let's say Trump's elected another four years. Maybe it doesn't happen during his term. You know, maybe it, maybe it happens after that. A lot of, there's been a lot of discussion on the analyst calls about uh, if COVID-19 accelerates this or not, you know, and I think if people that are emotion, emotionally vested in the industry, yeah, oh, this is going to accelerate it. And, and there's some merit to the argument. There's, a, there's also merits to the argument that it, it won't accelerate it at all, you know. So I think everyone's, everyone's hopeful. And I think that's what happens a lot in the cannabis industry is run so much by emotion and, and happy talk. And, you know, there's uh, just a lot of fundamentals that are, that are still missing in the industry right now. If you could give advice to entrepreneurs that are looking at you right now on a Zoom call, uh, what would be the p good first piece of advice you'd give us as we start our venture in this space? Go, go in with your eyes wide open. I mean, I've, uh, even though I, I, I wrote a book on the most absurd things I've, I've, I've seen in the industry, I've seen it in other industries as well. But don't go you know, from a banking uh, industry where everything's buttoned up and there's procedures, and probably overkill, right? Uh, if you've never worked in entrepreneurial startups before, uh, this probably isn't for you. Uh, on the other hand, this is a, this is a uh, an industry where you can make a big impact, you know, um, to help move the ball forward. Right, which is what we're trying to do actually here by telling the stories of the cannabis industry through their own words. And I think even someone like you, Dean, who wrote this book, uh, through your own uh, observations of the industry with your depth of experience, um, there's still hope for this uh, because it still goes back to fundamentals of like, let's see, we need to bring in more revenue than we spend, right? I mean, that's about as simple as it gets. Yeah, I mean, there's that. And, and I know the companies I was working with, I would say, you know, we got to take a stock compensation uh, expense hit. And they were like, oh, this wasn't on my radar screen. So you got that, you got that level of naivete mm -hmm. uh, where people should just know better, you know. Uh, and uh, it'll, it'll take a little bit of time. It's getting, it's getting better. I, 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 have we bottomed out? I'd like to hope we've bottomed out. Um, you know, back in December, January, it really couldn't get much worse. You know, there really wasn't a lot of good news. Some of these stocks just within the last month are ticking up a little bit. But I think I don't get excited about week to week or month to month. You know, I kind of look out maybe by the end of the, this year, the industry a little bit be a little bit more stabilized. But it's going to take, you know, new people to come in and, and put some internal controls and, and procedures in place. And, and, uh, you know, acquisitions, which were, which were a fad a year and a half ago, you know, people are getting a little smarter at it right now. You know, they, they understand they can't overpay. The math doesn't work. Is your phone still working, even though you have this out now published? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I, I had my wife start my car. <laughs> <laughs> but I love her. You do love her. I know you do because you travel everywhere with her. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny. 80% 80, 80 of the feedback I'm getting is like, man, you nailed it. Yeah. This stuff's going on in my company. I thought this was all normal, you know, and, uh, and it's really been an eye opener. And then the 20% of the people that, you know, 
probably you know have a have a contract out on me are in the C suites of the companies I, I'm I'm talking about now. But again, I have I have no ponies in the race. I've got some investments in cannabis. You know, I continue to consult and work. And if the, if nobody wants uh, my advice, I got other things to do. So uh, I'm not, I'm not getting emotionally tied to this anymore. You know, I I kind of wrote in my book too that I was emotionally tied in the um, in the internet days. And I said, boy, I'm not letting my, my guard down again. You learn your lesson from the dot coms, right? Is that pretty much what that was? Yeah. Well, I uh, appreciate the lessons you've shared with us today, both on this show and also in your book, Dean. I really enjoyed uh, chatting with you. But before you go, okay, I'm not going to ask you your top 10 golf courses, but I will ask you your top three. And let's, I think I know one of them. What's the top three golf courses you've played? Um, I don't know if I want to go right down the, the, to golf course, but I will tell you areas. So my wife and I went out to uh, Scottsdale and Sedona last year. Of course, Scottsdale, Arizona golf is, is great. Love it. Michigan's got some good golf courses as well. But the up-and-coming uh, go-to destination is Branson, Missouri. Uh, there, is a, there are about five golf courses down there. Uh, and look, uh, your viewers could look up Big Cedar Lodge. The guy that owns Bass Pro Shops, Johnny Morris, uh, basically built this whole resort. Tiger Woods uh, has one golf course in the United States that he's an architect of, and it's opening up uh, as we speak down there. And I was down there last year, and my wife and I are going down there again. It's, it's near Branson, Missouri. But Big Cedar Lodge is my number one place to golf. Not Pebble Beach. I've never, I, I, I've walked it, but I've never played it. Yeah. All I can tell you is I had a dream round at Pebble Beach on a 75 degree, no wind day. Okay. And walked up to the, and I got the last tee time, the golden handshake. Are you familiar with that? Do you know what the golden handshake is to starters? No. You give a starter a hundred dollars and you can walk on pretty much. Okay. Not that I did that, but okay and i was told to do it so i did plus i knew the starter that helped um it, it it's still the carmel california and the monterey peninsula is still the most beautiful spot on earth that i've seen so far and being able to play golf there was a, a, a religious experience it really was amazing and i totally want you there dean you have to go and then you call me after and you say you're right that's better than was it branson missouri where am i going yeah yeah it's a golf destination. Big Cedar Lodge, so, Jimmy. Big Cedar Lodge. Big Cedar Lodge. Big Cedar Lodge, yeah. So you must be a better golfer than me, Jimmy, because sometimes I go out and the best two balls I hit all day is when I step on the rake in the sand trap. There you go. That's a great line. Uh, I would say just remember the average round of golf in America is 100, and I hit it right on the nose with a 12-foot bender on the 18th hole at sunset at Pebble Beach. It was magnificent, let's just say. And uh, the book that Dean Matt has written has gone to pot. Uh, welcome to the blank show. So uh, Dean, again, thank you so much for joining us here on Weed Talk Now. Once again, remember, it's a whole new world of weed out there. Use it responsibly. So for Dean Matt, Kurt, I'm going to do it for you too. For Kurt Dalton, the founder of Cannabis.net, I'm Jimmy Young from Pro Cannabis Media. Thanks for joining us. And again, remember, use it responsibly. We Talk Now, We Talk News, and In the Weeds are all available on most major podcast distributors like iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and our friends at clnsmedia.com and our flagship, cannabis.net. So subscribe, share, and like our videos on all the social media networks out there, including LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, The Weed Tube, and YouTube. Weed Talk and In the Weeds are two productions of Pro Cannabis Media supported by Revolutionary Clinics, one of the top medical cannabis dispensaries in the Massachusetts area. Now with three locations in Greater Boston, two in Cambridge and one on Broadway in Somerville. Rev Clinics has a patient first mission. They will customize your needs as a medical patient with the proper titration and combination of strains, flavors, and products. Rev Clinics, where the patient comes first. We are Pro Cannabis Media.